The Desire of Ages, chapter 56, Blessing the Children. Jesus was ever a lover of children. He accepted their childish sympathy and their open, unaffected love. <laughs> the grateful praise from their pure lips was music to his ears and refreshed his spirit when oppressed by contact with crafty and hypocritical men. Wherever the Saviour went, the benignity of his countenance and his gentle, kindly manner won the love and confidence of children. Among the Jews, it was customary for children to be brought to some rabbi that he might lay his hands upon them in blessing. But the Saviour's disciples thought his work too important to be interrupted in this way. When the mothers came to him with their little ones, the disciples looked on them with disfavour. They thought these children too young to be benefited by a visit to Jesus and concluded that he would be displeased at their presence. But it was the disciples with whom he was displeased. The Saviour understood the care and burden of the mothers who were seeking to train their children according to the Word of God. He had heard their prayers. He himself had drawn them into his presence. One mother with her child had left her home to find Jesus. On the way, she told a neighbor her errand, and the neighbor wanted to have Jesus bless her children. Thus, several mothers came together with their little ones. Some of the children had passed beyond the years of infancy to childhood and youth. When the mothers made known their desire, Jesus heard with sympathy the timid, tearful request. But he waited to see how the disciples would treat them. When he saw them send the mothers away, thinking to do him a favor, he showed them their error, saying, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. He took the children in his arms, he laid his hands upon them, and gave them the blessing for which they came. The mothers were comforted, they returned to their homes strengthened and blessed by the words of Christ. They were encouraged to take up their burden with new cheerfulness and to work hopefully for their children. The mothers of today are to receive his words with the same faith. Christ is as verily a personal saviour today as when he lived a man among men. He is as verily the helper of mothers today as when he gathered the little ones to his arms in Judea. The children of our hearts are as much the purchase of his blood as were the children of long ago. Jesus knows the burden of every mother's heart. He who had a mother that struggled with poverty and privation sympathizes with every mother in her labor. He who made a long journey in order to relieve the anxious heart of a Canaanite woman will do as much for the mothers of today. He who gave back to the widow of Nain her only son and who in his agony upon the cross remembered his own mother is touched today by the mother's sorrow. In every grief and every need, he will comfort and help. Let mothers come to Jesus with their perplexities. They will find grace sufficient to aid them in the management of their children. The gates are open for every mother who would lay her burdens at the Saviour's feet. He who said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, still invites the mothers to lead up their little ones to be blessed by him. Even the babe in its mother's arms may dwell under the shadow of the Almighty through the faith of the praying mother. John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit from his birth. If we will live in communion with God, we too may expect the Divine Spirit to mold our little ones, even from their earliest moments. In the children who were brought in contact with him, Jesus saw the men and women who should be heirs of his grace and subjects of his kingdom, and some of whom would become martyrs for his sake. He knew that these children would listen to him and accept him as their redeemer far more readily than would grown-up people, many of whom were the worldly wise and hard-hearted. In his teaching he came down to their level. He, the majesty of heaven, did not disdain to answer their questions and simplify his important lessons to meet their childish understanding. He planted in their minds the seeds of truth which in after years would spring up and bear fruit unto eternal life. It is still true that children are the most susceptible to the teachings of the gospel. Their hearts are open to divine influences and strong to retain the lessons received. The little children may be Christians, 
having an experience in accordance with their years. They need to be educated in spiritual things and parents should give them every advantage that they may form characters after the similitude of the character of Christ. Fathers and mothers should look upon their children as younger members of the Lord's family, committed to them to educate for heaven. The lessons that we ourselves learn from Christ we should give to our children as their young minds can receive them, little by little opening to them the beauty of the principles of heaven. Thus the Christian home becomes a school where the parents serve as under-teachers while Christ himself is the chief instructor. In working for the conversion of our children, we should not look for violent emotion as the essential evidence of conviction of sin, nor is it necessary to know the exact time when they are converted. We should teach them to bring their sins to Jesus, asking him for forgiveness and believing that he pardons and receives them as he received the children when he was personally on earth. As the mother teaches her children to obey her because they love her, she is teaching them the first lessons in the Christian life. The mother's love represents to the child the love of Christ, and the little ones who trust and obey their mother are learning to trust and obey the Saviour. Jesus was the pattern for children, and he was also the Father's example. He spoke as one having authority, and his word was with power. Yet in all his intercourse with rude and violent men, he did not use one unkind or discourteous expression. The grace of Christ in the heart will impart a heaven-born dignity and sense of propriety. It will soften whatever is harsh and subdue all that is coarse and unkind. It will lead fathers and mothers to treat their children as intelligent beings, as they themselves would like to be treated. Parents, in the training of your children, study the lessons that God has given in nature. If you were trained a pink or a rose or a lily, how would you do it? Ask the gardener by what process he makes every branch and leaf to flourish so beautifully and to develop in symmetry and loveliness. He will tell you that it was by no rude touch, no violent effort, for this would only break the delicate stems. It was by little attentions, often repeated. He moistened the soil and protected the growing plants from the fierce blasts and from the scorching sun. And God caused them to flourish and to blossom into loveliness. In dealing with your children, follow the method of the gardener. By gentle touches, by loving ministrations, seek to fashion their characters after the pattern of the character of Christ. Encourage the expression of love toward God and toward one another. The reason why there are so many hard-hearted men and women in the world is that true affection has been regarded as weakness and has been discouraged and repressed. The better nature of these persons was stifled in childhood and unless the light of divine love shall melt away their cold selfishness, their happiness will be forever ruined. If we wish our children to possess the tender spirit of Jesus and the sympathy that angels manifest for us, we must encourage the generous, loving impulses of childhood. Teach the children to see Christ in nature. Take them out into the open air, under the noble trees, into the garden, and in all the wonderful works of creation, teach them to see an expression of his love. Teach them that he made the laws which govern all living things, and he has made laws for us, and that these laws are for our happiness and joy. Do not weary them with long prayers and tedious exhortations, but through nature's object lessons, teach them obedience to the law of God. As you win their confidence in you as followers of Christ, it will be easy to teach them of the great love wherewith he has loved us. As you try to make plain the truths of salvation and point the children to Christ as a personal saviour, angels will be by your side. The Lord will give to fathers and mothers grace to interest their little ones in the precious story of the babe of Bethlehem, 
who is indeed the hope of the world. When Jesus told the disciples not to forbid the children to come to him, he was speaking to his followers in all ages, to officers of the church, to ministers, helpers, and all Christians. Jesus is drawing the children, and he bids us suffer them to come, as if he would say, they will come if you do not hinder them. Let not your unchrist-like character misrepresent Jesus. Do not keep the little ones away from him by your coldness and harshness. Never give them cause to feel that heaven will not be a pleasant place to them if you are there. Do not speak of religion as something that children cannot understand, or act as if they were not expected to accept Christ in their childhood. Do not give them the false impression that the religion of Christ is a religion of gloom, and that in coming to the Saviour they must give up all that makes life joyful. As the Holy Spirit moves upon the hearts of the children, cooperate with his work. Teach them that the Saviour is calling them, that nothing can give him greater joy than for them to give themselves to him in the bloom and freshness of their years. The Saviour regards with infinite tenderness the souls whom he has purchased with his own blood. They are the claim of his love. He looks upon them with unutterable longing. His heart is drawn out, not only to the best behaved children, but to those who have by inheritance objectionable traits of character. Many parents do not understand how much they are responsible for these traits in their children. They have not the tenderness and wisdom to deal with the erring ones whom they have made what they are. But Jesus looks upon these children with pity. He traces from cause to effect. The Christian worker may be Christ's agent in drawing these children to the Saviour. By wisdom and tact, he may bind them to his heart. He may give them courage and hope, and through the grace of Christ, may see them transformed in character, so that of them it may be said, of such is the kingdom of God.